series in the book of Ruth, chapter 1. Now remember, we're not going all the way through the book of Ruth. We're not doing that. We may do that in the future. We're just looking at excerpts of her life to learn some things for daily living. She is a testimony. She is an example of a lifelong commitment. You get that? A lifelong commitment. And she's an example of that. And she sets an example for us to have a lifelong commitment to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we begin in verse 1, And it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and her, his two sons. And the name of the man was Imelech, and the name of the wife Naomi, and the name of two sons, Malion and Chilion, Ephraimites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, and Imelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons, and they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Ophrah, the name of the other Ruth, and they dwell there about ten years. And Malion and Chilion died, also both of them, and the two women were left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. This set forth a journey in the life of this woman from a pagan, wicked society to becoming right in the center of the lifeline, the lineage that was going to bring Jesus Christ into the world. A Moabitess, a pagan, just like Abraham was a pagan, found in the most wicked culture that you could find, Ur of Chaldees, wicked, and yet God called him out. And so God reaches down to this woman that had lost her husband, picked her out, and did some amazing things with her. What does God want to do amazing in your life? What does He want to do? Are you letting Him do it? What's an amazing thing that God wants to do for you and through you? What is it? Does it concern you? Do you want to be a part of His eternal plan? This woman was a part of God's eternal plan so that we could be redeemed. Boaz in this passage of scripture is a type of the kinsman redeemer. He's a type of Jesus that paid for our sin, that bought us, brought us back, paid our sin debt, and brought us out of sin's bondage and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love the story. It's a love story, but it is a tremendous illustration of the grace of God and how God works. Let's pray. Father, lead us as we go into this passage of Scripture this evening. Speak to our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. What does the life of Ruth teach us about God's plan? First of all, it tells us that God's redemptive plan goes beyond the Jew to the Gentile. Now, if you talk to a Jew today and mention Jesus, they, they might hit you, curse you. They certainly don't want to hear the name of Jesus. They do not believe he was the Messiah. They've been in darkness now. All of these hundreds of years, they've been in darkness. And one thing that they could not grasp is what Jesus said about grafting in the Gentiles into the family of God. And yet here we begin a portion of Scripture where we're going to see that in the future God is going to graft in the Gentiles into His family. You see that in chapter 2, verse 12. The Lord recompense thy work. 
and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Now watch this. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. You know what God was saying to Ruth? He has brought you under his wings. And because of that, you've trusted in him. You're under his wings. And through you, my plan is going to continue. What a great thought. What a tremendous thought. God had a plan. And now he's working his plan. But there's something else. Ruth shows to us that men and women are equal in the redemption plan of God. Now back in those days, women were considered property. Property. Even in the days of Jesus. And by the way, Jesus did more to lift women than any man ever did when he was here on the earth. And thank God for that, ladies. Thank God for that. So when it comes to redemption, there's no difference between men and women. Turn to Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 28. Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 28. A great passage of scripture here for the child of God. Actually begin in verse 26. For you are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you have been baptized, now that's not water baptism, that's spiritual baptism, unto Christ and have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. When it comes to God's redemptive plan, no difference. Men and women, there's neither male nor female, you are one. Now, when it comes to the work of God, yes, God has a plan for men, God has a plan for women. It's God's plan that the man be the leader in the home. That began in Genesis. One of my best friends back in Tennessee is Brother Jerry Desern. Brother Jerry was uh, the uh, DOM, Director of Missions for the Jefferson Baptist Association for over 18 years. And uh, Jerry was a staunch believer in the doctrines of the faith. And there were some women in the Jefferson Baptist Association that were pushing for men to be, or for women to be pastors and deacons. And they were pushing it. They had a big debate at Carson Newman College. And these two women stood up and spoke their piece, were given the opportunity to do that. And Jerry Desern stood up and said, Ladies, it's not cultural. It's not a cultural thing. It's not a male-female thing. It's a biblical thing. It's a doctrinal thing. And so Jerry took them back to Genesis where God said the husband is to be the leader in the home. The husband will have the authority in the home as the spiritual leader in the home. Now, when it comes to the church... God will call a man to be a pastor. He'll call a man to be a deacon. Does that mean women are set aside as second? Absolutely not. I've said God uses women. I've said this before. When God gives the qualifications for a deacon, he talks about the deacon's wife. That's interesting, isn't it? She's very important to him. She assists him in his work of a deacon. She's valuable to him because as he takes his wife with her, with him, he can go to places that he should not go by himself or a group of men should not go. And I could go on and on with this, the value of a woman. But did you know that when it came to the qualification for a pastor, it doesn't say anything about the pastor's wife? You know why? Because her number one responsibility is to take care of her husband. Sue has been a valuable, valuable asset to me. Little pile here, little pile there. I'll set that aside. A, va a valuable asset to me. And thank God for that. And so we work together. And uh, 
Now, Mike and Sue have had a running battle. Sue calls him Father Mike, and Mike calls her Pastor Sue. And it's a running, it's been a running debate between those two forever. Darlene and I have been enemies from day one. Day one. And we continue to battle till this day. I love it. I always win. I always win. All right. I know what you're going to do. I know you're going to go home tonight. I know you. All right. Let me get away. Thirdly, Ruth is a perfect example of the virtuous woman that's mentioned in Proverbs 31. Now, ladies love Proverbs 31. They just love it. And turn to Proverbs 31 and look at verse 10. One of John R. Rice's daughters was teaching here years ago when we had our ladies, uh, what was that called, Sue? Jubilee. Ladies Jubilee. And she, I, I was sitting in the back back there with the, the president of the Sword of the Lord and some other guys sitting in the back. We wanted to see the opening up. We wanted to be here. And so she walked up here to the platform. By the way, Dr. John R. Rice had seven daughters. All of them married preachers. All of them. Well, anyway, she walked up here and said, ladies, turn to Proverbs 31, and I know you're just going to love this verse. This is your favorite verse in the Bible because it's preached on all of the time. And we may laugh about that, but let me say this seriously. Look at verse, if you will, here at verse chapter 31, and look at verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The word virtuous means moral excellence. A man finds a wife who is an example of this Proverbs 31 woman. He has found a wife with moral excellence. And you can't put a price on that. You can't put a price on that. You folks here that are raising young men, you husbands and wives, you're raising young men, teach them, train them, do everything that you can to direct them to marry a virtuous woman, a godly woman. She is an example. Ruth is an example. And, of course, if you follow this whole line of thinking in Proverbs 31, she is an excellent wife in dress, in demeanor, in morals, in work. And her husband rises and calls her blessed. Now look at verse 23. He talks about her husband. Her husband is known in the gates. When he setteth among the elders of the land. I've noticed that a man usually doesn't rise to that kind of leadership and that kind of uh, direction and authority without a, a good wife. You see, a moral wife, a virtuous woman, will lift the man's stature, will lift the man's leadership. He's not ashamed to take her anywhere. He's not worried about her talk or her demeanor or dress or whatever. Uh, he's not worried about that. Uh, she's a perfect example. She goes out and works with her hands. She takes care of her kids. In verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Now, no wonder Boaz had his eye on Ruth. Amen? He had his eye on a moral, godly woman. Now, not only that, but Ruth teaches us something about the sovereignty and the providence of God. In my mind, probably the greatest doctrine that you could ever study in the Bible is the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. 
Now, go to Isaiah 55. I think you've already, I've taken you all around, but that's okay. I like to see people using their Bible. Get to know your Bible. Memorize the books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. And, and memorize the books of the Bible. Be able to spell them. Know what each one of them is teaching. Each Bible, each Bible book has a theme interwoven in redemption. Now, I come to Isaiah 55. Hold your place there. Now watch. Do you have questions about the sovereignty of God? There's one of the greatest debates in Christendom when it comes to the sovereignty of God, election, predestination, and the providence of God. Now let me just say this, and we're a Wednesday night crowd. You'll hear me say, and I think I need to clarify so you won't misunderstand, I am a Calvinist. If you want to use a man's name, you see, Calvin and Arminius and Augustine and Luther back in the 1500s began to preach what we call Calvinism or the sovereignty of God or election predestination. Arminius and these other men are identified as Arminian. Now, if you use those two names to qualify what you believe, I have to be a Calvinist. You know why? Because if you're a Calvinist, you believe in the preservation of the saints. Once a believer is saved, he cannot lose his salvation. Now, the Arminians teach that you can lose your salvation. You can be saved, you can lose it. You can be saved and you can lose it. Now we could argue all night about Calvinism, Arminianism. We could argue all night about predestination, election. But now let me say this to you. It's not left up to man just to, I'll choose when I want to. I'll choose, I'll live like the devil. And I've heard men say, I'm going to live like hell. And when I get older, I'll get saved and then go to heaven. No, you won't. No man can come to me, Jesus said in John 6, except my Father draw him. When I was six years old, I didn't understand it. I didn't know it, but God drew me. Now, let me say this again. As far as my Father in heaven is concerned, I was saved when He chose me in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of life. As far as Jesus is concerned, I was saved when He rose from the dead and said, It's finished when I'm on the cross. But as far as the Holy Spirit and I am concerned, I was saved in the month of May, 1951, when a preacher said, come whosoever will may come I went I got on my knees I asked Jesus to save me and so as far as the Holy Spirit is concerned I was saved on that day when I responded to his call that's the best way I can clarify the whole thing without getting into a debate, more debatable issues just rejoice in this they who believe will be saved I would label myself, if you really, if you're going to label yourself, I would label myself as a Spurgeon Calvinist. Charles Spurgeon preached to thousands in London. And he believed that you couldn't be saved except God drew you. And then he'd stand in the pulpit with weeping eyes and with tears running down his cheek. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Savior, please come. Please come. Don't, don't leave this without Him today. Please come. If a man will do that, I have no problem. I have no problem. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I believe in whosoever will may come. Okay? But now let's go a little deeper in this sovereignty of God. Now you see it all through the book of Ruth. From the time in Moab until the time 
she lays down at Boaz's feet. Boaz discovers she's there. He gets up and takes his outer coat and covers her with it. And in the Jewish economy, he was saying, I have chosen you to be my bride. Her laying at his feet said, if you are choosing me, I'm choosing you. Isn't that beautiful? And that love relationship between Boaz and Ruth. Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. He had the lineage. He had the desire. He had the price. A kinsman redeemer had to fit those three criterias. He had to have the want to. He had to have the whether all to do it. And he had to choose all of that. And he did. Okay? But now let's go a little deeper. And I'm going to read Isaiah 55 in just a moment. Sovereignty of God. Israel goes into evil, worshiping idols, worshiping calves. They go into idolatry. God has said to them over and over and over again, if you will follow me, if you will do what I tell you to do, I'll bless you, I'll cause your cattle to produce, your sheep to produce, I'll cause the ground to produce, I'll cause your grain to produce. You follow me, you obey me, your children will be blessed, I'll bless you, but you disobey me, I'll chasten you. Many times that happened. Okay, so what does God do? God raises up a wicked Gentile nation, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, raise up these wicked nations, raise them up, and through his sovereign leading, sent them to chasten the nation of Israel. And when Israel got right, God turned around and chastened that evil nation. In God's sovereignty, He made them do it. And then turned around and chastened them because they killed His people. Question for you. How do you rectify that? God's evil. God's not just. See, people say this all the time. The God of the Old Testament is a mean God. A wicked God. But Jesus is the loving one. Wait a minute. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right. Look here in Isaiah 55. Let's actually begin. Well, we really need to get the whole gist. We need to begin in verse 1. I love this chapter. Ho, oh, everyone that is thirsty, come ye to the waters, and he that hath money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Let me give you a little lesson here. You'll see these kind of verses all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But then you'll see verses that indicate you can't come to me unless I call you. You know what I do? When I'm preaching through the Bible and I come to a verse like this, I preach this verse. When I come to those other verses, I preach those verses. That's all I know to do. But I do know this. Sovereignty and man's choice run side, to side, side by side, just like a railroad track. They run side by side. But it's verses like we're going to read here that will help us a little bit. Go on to verse 2. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in its fatness. Watch now. Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live. 
and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I give given for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run into thee because of the Lord thy God. And for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Now look at this. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call you upon him when he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Stop. All of this we've just talked about. All of this we've just talked about. God will answer it for us in the next few verses. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. Hmm. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It will not return unto me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Just put your faith and trust in God that you don't know everything He knows. You don't understand everything that He understands. He's not going to explain some of it to you or me because it's none of our business. Got it? The secret things belongeth unto the Lord. Now I know what you're saying, but, 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 but. I will tell you this. We'll understand it better by and by. Do you believe God is all loving God? I do. So let's leave the secret things, the dark things unto Him. Let's practice what we know. And Journey Baptist Church, let's do this. From the pulpit, Sunday school classes, visitation, missions, let's do this. Whosoever will may come. Will you come? Will you come? And you may think that person's going to come, and he doesn't. I've watched people come down the aisle. A couple over here just weeping and crying and repentance all over their face and they're saying, we want to be saved. And over here's a couple and they come forward and they say, I want to be saved. And there's not one tear. Not one dry, not, not one tear in their eye. They stand up and say, we're saved. They stand up and they say, we're saved. Come back that night and that couple's not there and you don't see them anymore and that couple's there for the rest of it. See, we would say, I've heard preachers say, I don't believe in a dry birth. They'd say, I don't believe in a person saying he's saved unless there's tears and weeping. Now there's got to be sorrow for sin. Godly sorrow. It, it works repentance, not to be repentance, repented of. Repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death, the book of Romans. So let's leave the hidden, the secret things to God, but let's enjoy what we do know about the sovereignty of God. It was not an accident that I was born, and I hate to say this, in Cat Holler, Tennessee. Okay, you didn't laugh, so we'll go on. I, I don't understand. I was just born into a family. I don't understand how God worked all of it to get me at Pleasantdale Baptist Church. 
where G.N. Francis was my pastor and Arthur Essis was my pastor. And then finally down the road to my chagrin, Wayne Williams. He's already called and said, when are you going to let me come down and preach to them people and tell them the truth about you? The deacons at Buffalo have already said they're going to try to come down and visit this summer and let them people know about, about you. I said, when you get there, I'm not going to let you talk to the deacons at that church. And we had a great time. But I don't know, but the sovereignty of God to get me saved, to get me into the will of God, to bring me where I am, and the same thing's true of you. Enjoy and love and thank God for his sovereignty. Okay, I have went, no, I was told not to say that, and I'm not going to say it. I said what I said, I've said it, and it's over, and now we're going to pray. So let's stand. All right, pray about faith promise this coming Sunday. What else are we going to pray about? We're going to ask the Lord for what in Sunday school, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? How many? Sixty. Sixty. All right. And how many on Sunday? Got it. Now, you're going to make your request known to God, right? But now, just don't do it and pray like this. Lord, give us 120. I don't really think it'll happen, but I'm going to ask for it. <laughs> Hebrews 11.6. For that faith it's impossible to please him. For him that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a what? Rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now you know what the old devil's going to do tonight? You're going to go home. You're going to turn the TV on. And then you're going to go to bed. And you're going to wake up and go to work in the morning. And through the course of the day the old devil is just going to try to wipe all this from your mind. And get you caught up in what's happening in your home at work. The Lord Jesus Christ needs to be the center of our life. Know the book and live it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. Russ, dismisses him.